Hi everyone, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein together with chess.com and I would like to welcome you to my series of lectures on King's Indian Defense Knight A6 Variation. And Knight A6 is a classical variation and it starts after D4, Knight F6, C4, G6, Knight C3, Bishop G7. One thing I like about the King's Indian is that you can pretty much play it against any move order as white. Uh, white can start with knight f3 or c4, but eventually both sides get to this classical setup position. And here castles, and white plays bishop e2. Of course, there are other ways for white to try to play in the King's Indian. There is the f3 Zemish variations, there is the bishop e2, bishop g5, the Averbach, uh, there is the h3 King's Indian and many other flavors of King's Indian. But classical is by far the most popular uh, choice for white. And here I play a rare move, knight a6. The idea behind knight a6 is most always we're actually going to transpose to the main lines. But typically black employs the e5 move, move order trying to attack white in the center right away. And the reason why I prefer knight a6 is, first of all, I'm keeping my options open. So I can strike the center with e5, or I can strike the center with c5. That's number one. Number two, I kind of want to avoid the drawing line after e5, d takes e, d takes e, queen d8, rook d8. This line is not considered dangerous to black at all. But nevertheless, um, it's really hard for black to get any counterplay. And that's why I prefer to start with the move knight a6. So here, most likely castles. And now I play e5, transposing to the main lines. c5 is a move that is also regarded as playable in this position. I personally haven't played it that much and uh, the positions are a little bit different and resemble more Benoni type, especially if white closes the center with d5. So that's why I'm going to focus my attention on the move e5 here. Okay, so we have reached the thematic or what is called the tabia position of the King's Indian Knight a6 variation. So let me briefly kind of give you an overview and introduction of the summary of the ideas why, for example, the knight is such weirdly placed here on a6. It, it appears as though black has violated a few opening principles, even if we roll back one more move. White has full control over the center with the e4, d4, and c4 pawns. And black has developed his knight on a6, which is against the classical approach that the knight should be developed to the center. So knight c6 or even knight bd7 are a little bit closer to the center than the knight on a6. But my basic premise, and you will see shortly, is that in King's Indian defense, it really is a fight for very specific type of key central squares and there is a lot of dynamic possibilities. And leaving the knight on a6, as you will see shortly, is going to give that dynamic edge to black. So after e5, for example, if white plays d5, immediately you see the benefits of the knight being on a6. For example, if the knight were on c6, you would have to waste the tempo and play knight e7, right? Whereas on knight on a6, you already got a free square on c5 and attacking the e4 pawn. And you're also keeping your bishop on c8 open. So this is really one very, very important 
uh, benefit of the knight being on a6. d5 is actually the first move that we're going to cover um, in the first lecture. There's also other continuations for white. White can play rook e1 with the idea that, you know, white is not going to commit himself to taking on e5 or playing d5. Instead, white is going to slow play this position, try to create some kind of bind in the center. So that's the idea behind rook e1. Another move is bishop e3, and this is by far the most popular move and is considered the main line. And we're going to cover this in the next series of lectures. And after bishop g4, sorry, after bishop e3, the move I recommend is knight g4 with complicated play. Now, d takes e, I should mention, is not as dangerous here as it was with the knight is on b8 and king on e1. And the reason being is that after we take everything on e5, we change in d8, bishop g5 now is not such a big deal. We can simply play rook e8. The knight is covering very nicely the c7 pawn. Knight d5 wouldn't make any sense because we simply can take on e4. And it looks like white simply gave up a pawn for nothing. If white tries to take on e5, this simply liquidates into an equal position. Bishop takes e5. And again, black has solved all his opening problems. Now you might ask, what about bishop g5 with idea knight f6? And the reason is bishop g5, rook e8, knight f6 doesn't work because we simply exchange and take on e2, and now black is up a piece. So d takes e is followed by knight takes e5. It is not dangerous at all. And let's start with trying to explore the center, locking up the center possibility d5. As I mentioned earlier, knight c5, throwing a tempo on e4 pawn. Now white can play queen c2, knight d2, or even bishop g5, trying to pin um, the knight on f6. None of these moves are dangerous. As a matter of fact, after bishop g5, we can even play h6, bishop takes, bishop takes, b4. And here, either knight a6 hitting the pawn, or knight d7 followed by bishop g7 and f5, gives black a lot of counterplay on the king side. Again, without the dark square bishop, white's initiative on the queen side is not going to be as dangerous, and the dark squares are going to be in black's control. So let's go back. And the most popular move here is queen c2. Keeping the eye on the e4 square and at the same time preparing this powerful thrust b4, trying to play on the queen side. And the typical ideas, of course, in King's Indian, black plays on the, on the king side, white tries to play on the queen side. But here, we want to prevent white to play b4 in one move, a5. And it turns out that this combination, the knight on c5 and the pawn on a5, really creates serious problems for, for white to try to get any counterplay on the queen side. The problem is clear after the move a3, because now we play a4 x clam and we fix the pawn structure completely. Now, white can never play b4. We got ourselves another outpost on b3. And clearly, black is doing great. So that's why white usually starts with b3. And now we play bishop d7. And here again, if white tries to play a3 to follow up with b4 idea, we play a4 x clan, breaking up white's plan. Of course, taking on a4 simply ruins white's pawn structure. We can simply recapture on a4 with the knight. And if white to play b4, the knight b3 hitting the rook, and now we got another outpost on d4 for our knight. So again, immediate a3, b3, a3 
followed by b4 doesn't work. So that's why typically white tries to play bishop g5 here and after h6 drop to e3. And here I prefer to move b6, not to even worry about the bishop takes c5 because we can always take to the b pawn. And here we have a very nice positional game. The knight can jump to g4, pawn can go to f5. We got ourselves a typical king's indian uh, and really nothing to worry about. Very good position for black. So let's go back and look at other possibilities besides queen c2. So again, bishop g5 we covered with h6. Knight d2 is not as dangerous at all because not only white is closing the c1 bishop, we can play a5 followed by bishop a6. This is another great resource. Now we really get to fight for the dark squares. So again, similar ideas without any problems here for black. So that pretty much concludes the d5 thrust in the center. So more uh, positional approach is, of course, play against this move, move uh, knight a6, is not to play d5, but to play something like bishop e3 or rook e1. So let's look at rook e1 first. Basically, white is saying to black, I'm not going to commit to playing d5 or d takes e. Potentially, I will play bishop f1. I will put my pieces in the center, create a powerful bind, and try to play against the bad knight on a6. So here, black has a few popular moves, such as uh, queen e8, uh, but maybe even c6. But the move that I like the most is bishop to g4. And as a matter of fact, I play this move with quite a success. And the main idea behind bishop g4, as you will see shortly, is actually aiming to create life for the knight on a6. So, for example, if white were to play e takes d, now we have a very strong intermediate move, bishop takes f3. So now, of course, if bishop takes, pawn takes, we got ourselves a very important position from this variation. The reason why it's so important is because now we have the outpost on d4 for our knight. And notice that white can't really challenge the d4 with any of the pawns. His only chance is to try to stop it with the bishop on e3 or the knight on e2. But if we are to take away a pair of knights, a pair of dark square bishops, and put black's knight on d4, we have a total positional dominance for black. That's why, even though white has a you know, pair of bishops, positionally black has a very clear strategic objective to aim for the d4. So the question is, how do you put the knight on d4 if bishop, let's say, goes to e3? One possibility is to play knight d7, preparing knight c5, knight e6, knight d4. And if white to play a3, knight c5, b4, knight e6, we have basically solved all of our opening problems. And now the ball is in white's court. How do you defend against knight d4? Knight d5, for example, is easily sold with the move c6, knight has to retreat back. Whereas knight d4 now, white is going to face some serious trouble. And already positionally, I think black is better. So this is a very important point behind bishop g4. So after d takes e, bishop takes f3. Of course, taking the knight is not that great because bishop takes e2 Pawn takes g7, bishop takes d1. We change, and clearly there is not enough compensation for the queen. All right. So after bishop g4, white has two options to try to fight for the advantage. 
Well, we can close, white can try to close the position with d5 here. And the second move is bishop e3. Bishop e3 is by far the most popular, but if white were to play d5, white can actually end up in some serious problems. And I will show you why. Knight c5, again, the same exact idea. You want to activate the knight, very strong outpost, and attack the e4 pawn. And here, white's best move is queen c2. And if white is not careful, if white were to play knight d2, black has a very tricky move, knight d3. And this trap, as a matter of fact, I have used many times online and won a lot of games, blitz, and a few over-the-board games. And the problem is, of course, we're using that pin on the bishop. The knight is totally protected because of that. And if bishop takes g4, knight takes g4, it turns out that white is having some serious trouble. For example, if queen takes g4, knight takes e1, it looks as though this knight is way deep into the enemy territory and is almost trapped, but the key word is there, almost. Because now if queen e2, then knight e2, followed by knight d4, knight is very strong on d4. And if queen d1, the knight d3, again, the knight escapes, and black is simply up in exchange. So I won a lot of games this way. The best move is by far rook f1, and here you can simply play f, f5 and get a great game for black. All right, so now d5 is not that great. And actually, I should mention that if white were to play his best move, queen c2, then now a5. And now if white were to play knight d2, it's important here that you don't trade the, the light square bishops. You play bishop d7. And the position is actually very similar to the d5 line we looked at earlier, except that black played bishop g4, bishop d7, and white played rook e1. And the rook totally doesn't really belong on e1 at all. Black's plan is quite simple. Knight e8, f5. At some moment, you also have the option to challenge white on the long diagonal, h6, c1. And black, in, again, has a very comfortable position. All right, so let's go back and look at the main move, bishop to e3. So remember, as I told you earlier, that bishop g4, you're fighting to create life for the knight on c6. So the question, how do you follow up with that? The knight can't go to c5. And the answer is quite simple. You still take the knight on f3. Now you exchange the pawn on d4. And notice that the knight can spring to action to c5, but there is a better move, and it is knight to b4. The knight is actually coming to c6, where it's going to hit the bishop on d4. I have played quite a number of games in this position and achieved pretty good results and pretty much equalized without any problems. And the key again is to understand that two concepts here is that dark squares, the outpost on e5 and c5 are very important, as well as the potentially square on d4. So let's look at some possibilities here. If white were to simply develop normally, let's say queen d2, knight c6, hitting the bishop, bishop e3, and now I want to show you the best squares for the knight. So the knight on c6 is already doing a good job of controlling these two squares. Now we got to have a support and cast involved. The knight f6 comes to d7, I in the e5 and c5 squares. And here, for example, if white were to play rook a d1, he centralizes strategy. Now we throw in knight c5. And let's say white continues with his centralizing strategy plan, queen c2, knight e6. And again, black has achieved his main objective. The, knight, the knights are controlling all the key squares. As a matter of fact, now you have an option to play knight d4. 
followed by c5 and really create a powerful outpost for the knight. And there's actually been some games in this position. And again, black did quite well in all of them. So let's go back. to this position. So this is one of the key moments where white can try to challenge black in the center and try to open up his bishops. So the bishops on f3 and d4. One of the key moves is e5. As a matter of fact, this move has been played against me by, by David Proust. And after e5, I played knight d7. Bishop takes b7. By the way, e takes d runs into this very, very unpleasant move. Bishop takes d4. Queen takes d4, knight c2, a tripled fork. Again, not very pleasant for white. So now, bishop takes b7 is really the only other option to try, try to play for advantage. Now, rook b8. Bishop d5, and here I have a very good move. Simply knight takes e5. Now knight e5 is actually a novelty. In the game I played c5, and white got a good possession. But after knight takes e5, it turns out that my knight is about to come to d3. You know, I can challenge the bishop with c6 or c5, and if white were to take on a7, then this is not a problem at all. Because now I have this intermezzo move, knight takes b d5. Of course, if bishop takes rook, then I got another intermezzo move, and you know, black is almost winning there. For example, bishop takes b8, knight c3, b takes c, queen takes, and I got two pieces for the rook with two weak pawns. So the best move is simply retreat the bishop so after knight takes d5, knight takes d5, and now after rook takes d, you know, b2, bishop d4, I can simply play rook b7 now, and now black is doing great. I got two connected pawns versus two weak pawns, and at any moment I can challenge white, white's knight with c6 or c5, and really have a great game. So this is... This attempt with e5 clearly doesn't work. Another attempt, c5, has been played by, by a few grandmasters against me. The recent game against Alex Lenderman from World Open. And here I simply play knight c6, follow with my plan. Bishop e3, d takes c, bishop takes c5, and simply rook e8. I'm two moves away from securing a good position. So knight d7 followed by knight e5 or knight d4. And if white were to play aggressively, let's say e5, then after knight d7 and we trade, then e5 pawn is going to be, you know, really weak. And then black is better. So the, the other option is simply to play queen b3 or even bishop e3. So if bishop e3... Then again, I play knight d7 with a great game. And queen b3 is, I think, what Alex Lenderman played against me. And his idea is simple. He's going to put pressure on my b7 pawn, potentially play rook d1. But again, it all works out black. So I play knight d7, hitting the bishop, bishop e3. I should mention that taking the pawn on b7 doesn't work. Because I got this intermezzo move, knight c to e5, x clan, threatening to ruin the pawn structure on the king side, and now threatening to win a piece. So there's really nothing better than to go to this position. Now knight e5. Notice how the queen is kind of trapped into my territory, whereas his king is wide open. And now I can play knight e5, like I showed you with counterplay, or I can even be more tricky. Take on c3 first and then knight e5. And after king g2, queen f6, it turns out that there is no way to defend the pawn, so you gotta move forward. 
And now another tempo move, hitting the rook and the pawn. And again, black is doing great. If the rook were to move, we basically get down to this position where black is better. So again, e5 or c5, black is doing great. So Alex played bishop e3 against me. Taking on b7 clear doesn't work. And here I play the move knight to d4. So really he has no better choice than to trade once. And now it turns out that again taken on b7, I get very powerful counterplay with the move knight e5. I got a fully centralized bishop. My knight is about to take on f3, allowing my queen to come in. And again, I got another threat, rook b8, rook takes b2. Very strong counterplay for black. So that's why Alex didn't take on d4. I'm sorry, he didn't take on, d on b7. He played rook a to d1. I still followed up with knight e5. And now we got down to this position. Knight b5, I took, queen takes, c4, c5. And now this position is about equal. And the key line is here if he, if he plays, for example, queen b3, I play rook e7. Notice how my rook does a very nice job of covering the uh, the seventh rank and defending the pawn on d4. If knight were to take on d4, so again, this is very good position for black. The game went on. Queen b4, rook d7, and then it all petered down to a draw. All right, so now let me go back. And kind of briefly summarize so far what we covered here in the rook e1 variation. So let's go back a few more moves. So rook e1, bishop g4, this is my pet line. And now we mentioned that d takes e is not a problem because of the key move bishop takes f3, followed by occupying the d4 square with the knight plan. Bishop e3 is by far the most popular, but very powerful plan, followed by knight b4, knight c6, knight d7, knight c5, knight e6. Again, think of King's Indian knight a6 variation in terms of ideas. There are a lot of variations I'm giving you, but all of them have very core ideas in mind. Number one, you know, you're fighting for keys squares, whether it's c5 outpost for the knight or d4 outpost for the knight if your pawn is on e5. Sometimes it's okay to give up your bishop for the knight, give opponent the bishop pair because you get your knights activated. And there, there's kind of a lot of strategic ideas built into the opening. That's why I like it so much. So let's go back even further and summarize that we covered so far. We covered d takes e. Again, not a problem at all. We covered the d5 move, but this only favors black because knight c5 comes in and rook e1. All of these three moves don't really pose any challenge to black. And if you know your plan, you know the strategic ideas, you're going to get a very comfortable game. And what's more important is that it's good to know a plan. If Even if you forget some lines I gave you, if you forget some ideas, if you know a plan, you know a way to achieve counterplay, you're good to go. So in the next series of lecture, we're going to focus on by far the most main line, the move bishop e3. Until then, see you and have a great time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.